Jesus, civil society activists, and foreign journalists covering unrest in her country. Uh, she was born in Swaziland and is the first in her family to graduate from college. She served as a prosecutor in Swaziland and Zimbabwe before leaving public service to open a private practice where she's earned an international reputation as an advocate for the repressed, especially those serving under the rule of the nation's current president, Robert Mugabe. We're also joined here tonight by a man in Cleveland who needs no introduction, but I'll introduce him anyway. CNN legal correspondent Avery Friedman, America's best-known civil rights lawyer and law professor, has litigated roughly 3,000 federal civil rights cases based off against the KKK, successfully tried one of the longest federal fair housing trials in American history, and has appeared at both the invitation of the U.S. Senate and House committees as an expert on civil and constitutional rights. He is the recipient of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference Legendary Champion of Civil Rights Award, the Ohio Humanitarian Award, and the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Award for Human Rights. We are so proud to have Avery again with us, many times with us on the stage. Uh, he is going to uh, moderate the conversation with Peter and Beatrice. There will be time for question and answer afterwards. Avery? Let me be the last, uh, Beatrice and Peter, to welcome you to our community. Um, there are so many things that I know many of the people here today want to ask, but let me start by asking very simply, um, both of you, through your passion and intelligence and work, both as a journalist and a lawyer, have brought to the world stage what goes on in Zimbabwe. Um, you both are here in Cleveland. Did you just meet? <laughs> Um, no, actually when Peter was uh, researching his latest book, I managed even to smuggle him into one of my cases as my assistant. <laughs> and he was carrying my, my, my really? slides. Yes. <laughs> and, and the judge believed me when I said, oh, this is my new assistant. <laughs> so yes, we have met uh, 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 in a number of times and if you read the book, uh, he does mention uh, this and that about me. Now, Peter is a, is a certified, in fact, this will be the first time any of you have been in the presence of a certified enemy of the state, which <laughs> is what Peter is. You are persona non grata in your land, your homeland. Yes, and well, I was, I was originally booted out a long, long time ago um, in, the, in the early 80s um, for writing about what I think in many respects, certainly, I mean, I don't know how one quantifies these things, but is still Robert Mugabe's principal moral stay, which is which I referred to towards the end of that reading, we call Kukurahondi, or the Matagilan massacres, when he sent his North Korean trained 5th Brigade down into the south of the country, and they killed, we think, probably about 20,000 civilians, but we've never been allowed to stage a proper inquiry. Um, and... Uh, and that was not something that uh, the authorities took well. And so I was, um, in fact, they, they tried to arrest me. I was tipped off, actually, and fled the country. Um, and after that, they said that I was a spy and all sorts of, um, all sorts of various things, and I was a, that I was an enemy of the state. Um, uh, so yes, I, I, I went through a period of not being able to go back to all that. That's true. Uh, do you ever expect to return? Well, in fact, I mean, it's a little bit complicated, but what then happened was that, that there was, there was, I mean, history is repeating itself. There was then a, uh, the, 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 southern, the, the southern political organization, or the southern based political organization, ZAPU, was kind of forced into a, in, was co-opted into the government. And one of the, um, one of its leaders, who I had actually helped to represent, and he was, he was charged with high treason himself, a guy called Demisa Dabengwa, became the home affairs minister 
whose brief it was to decide who was enemies of the state or not. So I called him up and said, uh, you know, you owe, do you owe me? Yeah. So he said that he could, he could guarantee that I could come back and see my parents and he could guarantee my safety as long as I didn't write things or pop up on CNN or whatever while Which I was there. Which is impossible, of course. <laughs> so I didn't used to do it while I was in the country, but I managed to broker a kind of deal at that stage. Um, Beatrice, uh, both you and, and Peter, I believe, were on a panel yesterday with a former ambassador in the United States to Zimbabwe. Did anyone raise the question of how our nation could support this autocratic uh, tyrant who has served as the head of state for so many decades? Was there a discussion about that? Well, not quite directly, but uh, I think some of uh, the audience will know that they are targeted individual sanctions of, amongst the uh, Robert Mugabe's political party. Uh, some of their assets in the United States have been frozen and they, they, they cannot touch them. And uh, basically they, they are also on travel restrictions, they cannot freely come to America. And uh, in addition, uh, there isn't direct assistance that's giving any, any assistance to the government other than uh, through USAID for, for, for health, education, etc., etc. Um, but uh, I guess that's what can be done. I don't know whether Peter knows anything else. Well, yes, I mean, I wouldn't want to bite the hand that feeds me now that I am a dual citizen and have American citizenship um, uh, and managed to score so highly on the citizenship test. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, actually, I've got several rather embarrassing things wrong, but I won't tell you what. Um, uh, I mean, we, you know, as, as voting citizens in the most powerful democracy in the world, our foreign policy in this country is extraordinarily important. We really can change the world in this country. We can... We are citizens, we are, you know, this is a democracy, we, we ought to be able to have the kind of foreign policy that we're proud of. And the truth is that our foreign policy is only, is only ethical and moral when, it's, when, when, when we deem it strategic, that that's the truth. So for example, you know, in, take, take the case of not just Mugabe, but many other African dictators. Um, for many years, up until 1990, in the end of the Cold War, we in this country, and not, not America alone, but as I say, America is pretty important. We were happy to, to support people like Mobutu in Zaire and our Congo and many other, many other dictators because they were our dictators. They were anti-communist and that was all that was important. And, 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 and even in Mugabe's case, after the Matabila massacres, which happened very early on in his regime in the early 1980s, nothing was done. There was no demarche at the UN. There was very little done at all. Um, and it's only recently that Mugabe has been sort of outed as the villain, that in fact he has been for, 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 for some time. But I think that we do have some contributory uh, culpability for this. I think that really we tend to intervene in places where, where there, there has, something has gone wrong in terms of human rights abuses only when certain other, um, when certain other bars are, are, are passed. And those, those, I mean, in Zimbabwe's case, I think that the, the two things that you really need before we get interested in changing the regime is you, there are two exports that you need, and those exports are oil and terrorism. And if you export those two and then start shooting your own your own citizens as well, then we'll get involved. But but if you, but Zimbabwe sadly has neither of those two exports, so it doesn't qualify as a quote unquote strategic interest. Beatrice mentioned that among the sanctions are prohibition, include a prohibition on Mugabe coming to the United States. Is, is that part of, of what's involved? Yes, it is, except of course when it comes to the UN, which is regarded as a, a separate state on its own. So he can come and be within, uh, uh, you know, certain, uh, I can't remember the exact mileage from the UN, but uh, he can come for those. Like he can go to some UN, uh, 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 European, uh, like if he has to go uh, to in, in Italy New for, you in know. New York? In New York he can come, yes, and, but only for UN purposes. That is allowed. 
and the international law. There is a story involving one of Peter's students that involved Mugabe, uh, not too right. I mean, long one, ago. One, one of the things of Mugabe, one of one of the, our last great hopes, since nothing else seems to be dislodging him, is that he's just he's very old. He's now eighty-seven. Eighty-seven. Eighty-eight. He just turned eighty. Yeah, almost eighty-eight. And there are there are you know, rumors. In fact, the recent WikiLeaks revelations, one thing or another, that he's got prostate cancer and various other things. But um, and in, in and last last year, in fact, when he came into what we just referred to for the, the UN plenary session, um, uh, I had been teaching at Columbia, and, and I'd been teaching a course that also included, you know, quite a detailed history of human rights in Zimbabwe or the lack thereof. Um, and a student of mine was slightly hung over one morning and went into a subterranean um, branch of a slightly scuzzy um, drugstore called, chain called Dwayne Reed looking for Alpha Salsa or other relief <laughs> from his hangover. And he was sort of rubbing his eyes and he looked up and there was Robert Mugabe. He seemed to have rubbed his eyes again and thought, this, this can't really be happening. And indeed, it was Robert Mugabe with an assistant who had a clipboard and on the clipboard was a shopping list. And they were standing next to the lipstick, um, an array of lipsticks. And, the, and they were both trying to read the shopping list their reading glasses. Um, and, and Mugabe's wife, Grace, who is, let me see, 35 years younger than him, I think, had given him the shopping list. And they were going, trying to find the right lipstick. <laughs> and this student of mine, Jonathan, you know, you often think if you had that dictator, you know, next to you, you'd tell him a thing or two. But suddenly, when confronted with it, you, you're overcome by your sort of social training that you know you don't shout at people and you shouldn't be rude and whatever and so he screwed up his courage and finally marched up to Mugabe and kind of you know started lecturing him and saying that he should be ashamed of himself one thing and they couldn't find anywhere to escape and, 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 and what, what, what he knows because he now works for, for as a human rights campaigner himself is that and you should bear this in mind if you ever happen to be in East Midtown during the UN <laughs> plenary session and you see a dictator wandering by here are the rules of engagement as long as you stay three feet away, don't make any sudden movements, don't raise your voice, and I think don't use bad language, oddly. The Secret Service will let you say what you want to say. It's a free country. So he did that, and then at the end of it, he, he realized he had a cell phone, and he returned and took a picture of Mugabe, which he attached at the bottom of the email he sent me. And the depressing, the depressing, the, this story has, a, has an unhappy ending, which is that the, the, the photograph he sent me of Mugabe was taken in very bad lighting conditions under fluorescent so and he looked like a million bucks. He looked like he could live forever. So it's a, there you are. I think his mother lived to a very great old age, didn't she? Really? She's a hundred and five? She died because she died. So genetics are not going to be found. And he's fine. He's going to be around. You know, speaking of, of, of free society, um, as Americans, we have in our DNA sort of, you know, an attitude uh, when it comes to government. We have the right of speech. We have the right to practice faith as we wish. It's sort of this independent attitude, which is part of the culture. Um, Beatrice, you actually find yourself in courtrooms arguing the freedom of the press when you have essentially a corrupt judiciary appointed by Mugabe, who controls everything. How, how can you possibly prevail on behalf of journalists who write things critical of, of, of Mugabe? It's a, a job that has to be done, and fortunately most of the cases start at the magistrate's court levels, where basically you have sort of civil servant type of a, uh, decision maker. It's at the High Court that it gets difficult because the High Court judges have been bribed with uh, uh, stolen farms, with SUVs, with Mercedes Benzes, and uh, they, they basically get uh, whatever they want from Robert Mugabe in exchange, obviously, uh, for certain kinds of judgments. Uh, but uh, my attitude is one of uh, doing it even if I know I'm going to fail for purposes of ensuring that, firstly, there's publicity. Uh, secondly, 